Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Gennady Myers, and welcome to Academy of Local Arts. This is the Russian. Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> This is a uh, Russian opera workshop. This is our second session. We started uh, in June with Eugene Onegin. Um, and uh, we worked for a month, had uh, uh, master classes. Uh, everybody learned to sing in Russian. And we performed with, uh, with uh, pretty good success, I will say. This is our second uh, session. Uh, this opera that we're doing in the next few days is called Iolanta by Tchaikovsky. Uh, this is the last opera Tchaikovsky wrote. Um, I think it's a pretty significant piece. We all love it. And uh, so please come and join us in the next couple of days. Um, today, I am very happy and privileged to introduce uh, a friend of mine. This is an easy introduction uh, because we went to school together. So we were classmates at Curtis. I studied piano. Darren Hagen uh, was the composition. Uh, <laughs> Hagen, pardon me. <laughs> Everybody who knew me in my 20s calls me Hagen. I can't, it's like That's, Bernstein, oh, Bernstein. A... It's Hagen, goddammit. Okay, <laughs> so I knew him as Darren Hagen, and uh, I will correct myself. Darren Hagen. And uh, since we were students, uh, Darren went on to become a very successful composer. Uh, he has been commissioned by the Philadelphia Orchestra and New York Philharmonic. Uh, he has written six, seven, eight, eight operas now. <laughs> um, he had been commissioned by the Seattle Opera, uh, and last year there was a, a work called Amelia that he worked on for five years, and it premiered in Seattle last year to great success. So I should not talk much, but I asked my friend Darren Hagen to <laughs> to talk about Iolanta, and really. Uh, take a, a perspective from a composer's point of view. That would be very interesting. And so, welcome, Darren, and it's good to see you. It's extremely unfair for old friends to take advantage of each other like that and, <laughs> and say Hagen Hagen and, and all of that nonsense, but when all is said and done, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years go by, and we're old men, or middle-aged men, thank goodness gracious. Gena's kids are going to college soon. I have an eight-week-old and a three-year-old pair of boys uh, robbing me of sleep, thank goodness gracious. Uh, and, and life goes on. And love goes on. And the reason I believe that, that Gannon invited me to do this was because years and years ago in 1982 or 1983, when we were, he was not more beautiful than he is now. I was far thinner and far more beautiful, though I had no idea how beautiful I was at the time. Uh, uh, studying with Ned Roram, uh, and, and Gannon played uh, the piano reduction of a cello concerto that I wrote for a, a classmate, Robert LaRue, who is now in, in, in what remains of the City Opera Orchestra in New York. And he played hit the Dickens out of it. And I was just stunned. And afterwards, he's, he said, well, what did Mr. Roram think? And I, I said, it was, it was great. He thought it was great. And he did. That's what he told me. And then Gena left, and Ned told me what he thought of my piece which was not so good. And that was the beginning of uh, a profound admiration for Gena and his fearlessness, even as a boy. Then I, I, I got to know Gena and his wife, uh, and we were all classmates together. That, if, I think, the invitation comes as a, an evening of scores. Since he had to play for my composition lesson, I have to speak for his festival. And I've done my homework, I promise. Not to be in any way coy or, or, or cute or twee about it. The reason I accepted also was because this is an extraordinary opera, Iolanta. Let me take 10 minutes of your lives to tell you why I feel that it's so extraordinary as a composer and as a music lover and as an opera lover. It was, as Gannis said, the last opera that Tchaikovsky wrote. 
It comes at a strange point in his life. The man had about 16 months to live. And I find it impossible coming to terms with my bursitis and my rheumatism and all the other ridiculous things that, that a man who's only 50 starts to come to terms with. He was only 54. But I believe that he must have been coming to terms with some very serious issues uh, about his own health. You know how a person isn't feeling quite right for a year. And for two years, they're not feeling right at all. And then you come to terms with pain in your joints. And then you come to terms with feeling tired all the time. And then you get tired of life. Or you just get tired of having to get up. You just want six cups of coffee so you can get to work. <laughs> I suspect, well, I feel that way because I'm never sleeping because my voice. But I suspect that Tchaikovsky, who went on after this piece to immediately compose the Nutcracker, and then the Pathétique, and the third piano concerto, and the D major string quartet, and then he died, the son of a gun. Amazing, this burst of creativity that happened in the last 16 months of this man's life. I find it almost in, in, impossible to believe as a composer myself, trying to understand this man, that he didn't have some sort of premonition that time was running out and in a way that Nutcracker was sort of the place he was going to take all those great tunes that he'd been putting in drawers and, and just put them in there, by God. Because you listen to Nutcracker, and there isn't a moment where you're not going, my God, look at that, there's another tune. Oh my God, look at that. Tchaikovsky knew that music was about tunes. We're talking about the transformative power of love, which I think is something Tchaikovsky believed in. Nutcracker, of course, is overcoming death through the coming to life of the Nutcracker, right? Nothing more or less than the Christmas story itself. Yolanta is about a woman, I mean, I'm going to just boil it down to the ridiculous essentials, uh, a young woman who's blind. Perhaps it's hysterical blindness, perhaps it's because of an accident. The original Hertz play in the Danish tells us one thing. It's pruned back for this libretto, but she's blind, and love brings her sight back. Now imagine, imagine if this opera had been written by Beethoven about a young man who had lost his hearing, who love. Do you think Beethoven would have written an opera for, in which the major character their hearing was brought back by love. See what a, an interesting sort of statement it is about the psychology and the value system of the composer who wrote the work, that Tchaikovsky would choose this piece and be so passionately involved with its creation, its composition. Love, I believe that Tchaikovsky felt at this point in his life, from all the letters I've read, he felt love is enough. I've been told many times in my life that love is not enough. But I think that at a certain point in your life, you have to embrace that it is. And that if it's not, then you have to think some more until it is. And I believe that this piece was composed by Tchaikovsky because he was working that out. Now let's get down to some, some, some nuts and bolts about this piece. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that hold it together. But let me just give you some context. It was written in 1892. And it was commissioned to be the first act of an evening, which would conclude with the Nutcracker. <coughs> Imagine a way of life in St. Petersburg where you have lunch, and then you go and see an opera called the Alanta, a new opera called the Alanta. And then you go to dinner. And then you go see a new ballet called the Nutcracker during the Christmas season. Because you're going to devote eight hours, and eight Wagner. This is not the Gesamtkunstwerk and the sit in your place and be good world of Wagner. This is a different, this is, this is St. Petersburg where people have, have different set of options. This is a more French society. This is a society of people who want to enjoy themselves. They want to have this evening. They want to spend eight hours. To me, that's, that, that in itself 
is, is what you call a mind blower back in the 80s. The same year Rimsky-Korsakov, at the age of 48, they were kids, wrote Malada. Leon Cavallo wrote Pagliacci. That was 34. Strauss wrote Guntram. He was only 28. Guntram, hmm. Uh, who, who was the conductor who told Copeland uh, at the premiere of the organ symphony that if a man can write that at 28, he can commit murder at 35 or something like that? Who was that? The guy who used to peck a gun, the conductor. <laughs> There's people out here who know that. Who was that conductor who used to carry a gun? Uh, Temp Tempest Fugit. Anyway. There are a few of them around. <laughs> <laughs> there are some great precedents for this opera, too. Now, the, we're talking about 1892, which is a very potent time in opera. Don't you agree? Pretty amazing time. Don Carlos premiered in 1867. So the relationship between the man and this opera, especially when they're talking politics, you really hear echoes of Don Carlos. It's really interesting. And uh, Geta explained to me over dinner uh, that that the couple for whom these, the, the starring roles were written, the woman had a villa in Italy and she, she was not unknown to Italian opera. It, I find it impossible to think because I steal from my colleagues ruthlessly. I mean, it's opera. I mean, come on, it's not brain surgery. If it works, do it. Uh, and, and if you can make it your own, even better than your Tchaikovsky. There are passages which could have been lifted right out of Don Carlo. But you know what's different? That soaring cello line that is always Tchaikovsky. Barry would never have done that. No way. Why, right? He would have always left the voices front and center. He would never have said, I am Barry, I will be in the orchestra. But Tchaikovsky is in the orchestra. Those cello lines, serenade for strings, uh, nutcracker, swan lake, da -da 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 I mean, it's a scale. But it's just devastating, isn't it? Uh, followers. Okay, 1926, not so far away, 30 years, right? Uh, there was a time in my life 30 years ago when I would have said 30 years is a lifetime. Well, now I look at 30 years. Nixon and China wasn't that long. Well, ooh, it was pretty long ago, right? Uh, a choir place, uh, a lot of great operas. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, it was fresh. For Puccini, writing Torandot, this show, this opera, was fresh. It was making the rounds. Uh, Mahler had conducted only a few years early, earlier in Hamburg the first non-Russian revival of this opera. Mahler! So I find it impossible to believe that the Puccini, uh, a, a magpie, if ever there was one, didn't know this piece. I believe strongly, when you listen to Iolanta's writing, that that's where Puccini got Liu in Turandot. The way he places the tessitura of the voice, the tranquility he demands of her. Who's singing her? Yeah. Isn't it hard to be relaxed down there? He's got sopranos singing A's and B's. I mean, you have to be relaxed. You cannot force it. It is a very specific sound in opera. We composers don't do that to you unless you're a lyric soprano and we score lightly under you. And then we take you up there and you earn your money. But most of the time, Liu sits down there on the staff. And I believe truly that Puccini cadged Liu from this opera. The composers, okay, now this is sort of the kind of thing you do on, what is it? Uh, Wiki, Wikipedia. <laughs> Composers born the same year that this opera was premiered. Mio and Onager. Isn't that bizarre? Mio and Onager. Such a French piece. Possibly the most French piece Tchaikovsky wrote. He was 52. And of course, now let's talk about the libretto a little bit. Composers of operas, we, we, we try not to talk about the librettos. Let's do it again. <laughs> right. um, I've had five or six excellent librettists over the years. Librettists, uh, it's like Oscar Levant said of conductors and orchestras, 
the one thing a conductor can count on from an orchestra is that they will eventually grow to hate him. <laughs> the one thing that an opera composer can count on is that the, their librettists over the years will grow to resent them. And I love all my librettists, and they all resent me dearly. God love them. The libretto was by Tchaikovsky's brother, Modeste, based on this wonderful Hertz original verse play by Henry Hertz. Now, this has got one of the most tortured roads toward fruition of any libretto. Original verse play by Hertz, translation by Fyodor Miller, stage-ready adaptation by Vladimir Zotov, then a libretto from that by Modesto. Now, the, other, the, the fifth unwritten hand, of course, is, is Tchaikovsky himself. Now, I'm just going to put a little footnote in here, a composer thing, because I'm a composer and I can't help it. All composers rewrite their librettos. Because we're, we behave ourselves, we don't admit it in public. <laughs> Compositional process. Um, he, Tchaikovsky had just come off of two years working on Queen of Spades. Now that two years sounds like a long time. Gena was kind enough to, to talk about the fact that I spent five years on Amelia, and I'm, I'm in my eighth opera right now. Several of them were overlapped. I'm really not 80 years old. It, I mean, I, it's, it's sort of like the circus leaves town and a new circus comes into town before the old circus has left town. You start a new project while the old one is, is uh, it's a nightmare. And it's a, but it's a glorious nightmare. But think about two years and think of the, un, the not the ennui, but the, the, the malaise that he must have been feeling, the exhaustion that he must have been feeling. I do know that after Amelia, uh, this opera that I wrote for Seattle Opera premiered, I was higher than a kite and the reviews were great and, and Five or six revivals were booked right away for the next three or four years. I had a sort of, I had, as, as Stephen Sondheim would say, I had a palpable hit on my hands. But I still felt like I just attended a wake. Because you can't go for five years and pour your heart and soul into anything. You know this from a six week rehearsal period. You pour your hearts and souls into a role and into a family, a new family, into a production. You second yourself to the vision of a stage director. Hey and a conductor, yee, and you make it all happen anyway. And you come to terms with this vision that you're all making together. And then all, and everyone leaves. You know, it's time to pick up your stuff and go to the next hotel. What a crappy life. <laughs> I'm, I'm with all, I say it with all my love. <laughs> I do, I think that it's just horrific. Um, and I think it's very, very, very hard and I, it's, it's, a, it's a life that is almost as hard as a dancer's life. Because they're like racehorses. You know? They don't even get to sing as long as you do. They don't even get to perform as long as singers do. And, that, um, and, and Tchaikovsky was well aware of this paradigm as well. This <coughs> surrogate family that is created by a cast and by a company. And he lived these shows also. My depression was, was actual. I mean, it was real. It was medical, and I wanted to stop composing. Imagine how Tchaikovsky writing a show that was is certainly as complex technically, Queen of Spades is certainly as complex as Amelia, though not as large, but it is very hard to go through the postpartum of a major show, no matter how many times you do it. I can see that he was probably really running on fumes so when he, when he started this show, in, this show, this opera in June of uh, 1891, uh, he writes in his letters to his, his uh, what do we call her? His benefactress, uh, that he feels burned out, that he feels as though he's just repeating Queen of Spades. Uh, and what he does is he starts with what in American musical theater we still call the 10 o'clock place in the book. That place, even though shows now close at quarter past 10 or 10 o'clock, they used to close at 11. And it was Moss Hart who coined the term the 10 o'clock spot, which is when the authors have to come up with the goods. That's when the hit song is, or when the hit song is reprised, or when the message comes, or when the authors show that this show was about X, 
and everyone stops playing with their keys, and they stop thinking about the subway home, and they go, oh, this is why I came to the theater. Well, what Tchaikovsky did, because he was a consummate man of the theater, was he wrote the 10 o'clock spot first. So that great duet that happens, what is it, part six? Seven. Part seven, thank you. You know the show a lot better than I do. In part seven <coughs> is a through composed scene. I'm in Philadelphia. I'm in this place that I love so much. I just love this place. One block from here, there used to be an Italian restaurant. What was the little place? The way or whereabouts. Oh, one block that way and one block over. The Italian restaurant. Yeah, the Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in 1982 or 19, I think it was 82 or 83, Giancarlo Menotti was, was brought back to Curtis from his castle. And uh, they, uh, Silverstein played his violin concerto, and I think that you, you were in the orchestra. I think they, they did the medium or something, I don't know. Anyway, he was just so charming. And the school, because that's the way Curtis is, they arranged for my buddy Norman Stumpf and I, Ned Roram's pupils, to have lunch with Giancarlo Menotti. So we go to the Barclay. And you know, it's like something out of Evelyn Waugh. Yeah, because they used to have these like chartreuse curtains everywhere, and they had these sort of overweight, middle-aged banker type guys, and these women who lunch, and these two kind of terribly underdressed students from Curtis, and this incredibly natty, worldly Giancarlo Menotti. So we go in there, and he, we say, what are we gonna talk about? What? And Norman says, make him talk about opera. I said, okay, okay, what are we gonna, okay, talk about opera. So he says, well, you wanna, you wanna, my darlings, you wanna hear about Parola Scenica. So for 25 minutes, he talked to us about Parola Scenica, which is the art of the through written scene. If you can make the music and the drama inexorably, yay, juggernaut-like, move forward through a scene, that is true opera. And this, number six, seven. seven. <laughs> ah! Part seven is true parola, Seneca. E flat major duet, a couple of great A, B, A, C, A, rondo, right? We know what we're doing. Suddenly, it explodes into E flat. You've got this duet, comes from nowhere, but of course it came from everything that just happened before. And then it doesn't end, but it evaporates into a continuation of the scene. That's the best stuff. That is, it doesn't get any better than that, and it's all totally Italian. Nothing French about it. It's totally varied. It's totally there. And it's really exquisitely done. And you sit there and you feel yourself pulled forward. <laughs> pulled <laughs> forward. <laughs> kicking over the sets as an audience member in a way that you don't feel in a lot of other Tchaikovsky even. And it was clear that whatever, and he, remember he wrote this first, right after Queen of Spades, it was clear to me that the guy was totally warmed up after writing Queen of Spades. And you know how you, feel, you can be exhausted, you can feel like you have nothing to say, but you're so warmed up that even your B game is fabulous. And you listen and go, oh God, if I'd only known that was so good. And I, I really think that that seventh section just kicks out the stops. And then he went backwards and he wrote the section before it, which uses all the Verdi tricks, including a full stop. There's, uh, there was at this time this huge thing going on uh, between opera composers about full stops and through composed scenes. A full stop is when there's a fermata over the bar line or something like that, or in, in any event, there's a tradition to stop the drama and not only invite, but insist that the audience applause happen. Now that's a very, very important part of dramaturgy, and it's something that really we were on the knife blade of in the 1890s, we, whoever we are. Co opera composers were really on the edge of the knife blade back then. Because you had a guy like Wagner who would refuse to, to, to let people go for three and a half hours. And then there were numbers guys, like Puccini, and we called them the circus musicians, who every three and a half minutes, they got <laughs> right? And, you know what I mean? Whether you like it or not, there's this insistent, it's like a laugh track almost. Now, it's a terrible that I should even say that because, I mean, when I go see, when I, when I see Bohem, I want to, you know, I can't help it. It's, but, I, but I feel myself going, eh, 
Yeah, of course. <laughs> and during the applause, there's a tension that's built up of its own. There's an expectation that has been thwarted of the drama moving on. The drama has lurched to a halt. And you've been pulled out of the drama. This is the whole argument. And you've been introduced to the applause and an expectation of, it's like a commercial almost, an expectation of the re, uh, resumption of the drama is created. And then you're also expected to be very excited about what's going to happen next. And that's a card that Tchaikovsky, who never played that card really, except in ballet, when it was, you know, duet, duet's done, solo's done, you know, you know how that is? It's, it's that kind of call and response in, in ballet. So it, it, he didn't do that so much in Queen of Spades. But he did that here, and I think that he did so ruthlessly and with great, uh, great dramaturgical brutality. Um, just, just as a point of reference, he wrote this fast. Look at Berg's Wozzeck. It took uh, Berg eight years to write Wozzeck. There were more notes, granted. Um, the nose, which is not that much shorter or longer, took Shostakovich just about a year, from 1926 to 28. Uh, Viles Mahagoni took about two years to write. Um, leaving aside the whole Gregorian versus Julian calendar thing, the premiere was on 18 December 1892 at the Marinsky. It was the premier theater in Russia at the time, everyone agrees. That's where Gurdjieff is now currently the music director. And to this day, a two-act version of it is repeated every two or three seasons by the Bolshoi. This is very interesting because it goes directly against Tchaikovsky's wishes to create a two-act version. But OK, now I'm, uh, I, I suppose I could talk about the story. But I, I, I've given myself about four more minutes to, to say a couple of other things. Uh, you can project a lot onto your roles. And that's why a composer writes your roles the way that he does. He wants you to project. When, you, when the cast is in discovery, when you're doing table talk with the stage director, and you're discovering things about your roles, you do your research on this second lieutenant in a French military regiment in Provence in 1892. You say, what would his expectations be? What would the likelihood of his advancement? What would he care about? What would he wear? What would he eat? And when the stage director tells you to pull a lollipop out of your pocket, you say, no, sir. That is not what you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? You do your homework. You inhabit that role. Composers do the same exact thing. I would submit that uh, of the various motives in a time when a composer like Wagner was really seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, the mind of a, of a young Richard Strauss, with the idea of leitmotif. And, and a young Liszt was just dreaming up the first ideas of the B minor sonata on a beautiful lake, uh, Lake Como, let's say, in some rich lady's villa. You look at the brass in this opera, and they're always associated with Russian church music. They're always chordal, hymn-like. They're always associated with faith and power. You look at the woodwinds, the double reeds, oboes, bassoons, English horn. They're always associated with darkness and with Iolanta's inner life and the darkness that she is to be freed from. The only time in the score when three flutes are used are when Iolanta sings about light. And, and that third, there's a third flute. It's not called for in the instrumentation, but it's there in the score, you know, like you do. Uh, mm. And there it is. Whenever he talks, of, whenever the men talk about love, the cellos go up on the A string. These are not empirically provable things, but when you do your score study, they're what emerge. <coughs> These are not the intuitive acts of an amateur. These are the cold-blooded moves of a professional, not in mid-career, but at the top of his game. I'm not quite sure that I'm, I'm being completely uh, candid about the fact that when professional com opera composers talk about these things, 
many people who are not professionals themselves become very upset and they think less of us because they have a sentimental need for the idea of inspiration, whatever that is, and intuition to have led completely the game. But in fact, just as in the writing of a major novel, where a novelist puts the ideas and motives of his novel on note cards and, and pins them up on the wall so that he can keep, keep track of them, composers do the same exact thing. They track these motives, they track these ideas, these general, general ideas, including key centers, like E flat major, where all the good stuff in Eola is gonna happen. Why? You know why? Because E flat major is the coolest key for brass. It just is. It's the plush key for brass. And it's also a great key for the, 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 the clarinets. Not so much for the clarinet name, but there you go. He <laughs> takes a B flat. <laughs> then he goes into a keyless space for moments of great emotional transition. There are a few other things that he does. For me to explain them to you is for me essentially to take a Renoir painting and say, here is the palette that he was using. Look at all those pretty colors. Wasn't it great that he put that orange there and then, and, and look, look what happened. This is the, this is the, uh, this is what theorists do. This is what musicologists do. And this is what composers try not to do. You know what I mean? But this is all we can do when, we try, when we're trying to understand where a man who was in the last 16 months of his life, who's trying to figure it out and trying to come to terms with his own mortality, why he would make the decisions that he made and why he would choose a play that's absolutely ridiculous, really. It's really King Lear plus Barney Rubble. I mean, it's a, it's a ridiculous play in many ways. But, and, and that's not to say that many operatic libretti are ridiculous and stories are ridiculous. Turandot is ridiculous too. But what is the story really about? A father's love for his daughter? A father's willingness to do anything to save her and her sight? My God, anybody who's had small children. I mean, Gen asked me to do this with small children. Oh, I wanted to kill myself. I look at my boy, and he's beautiful and perfect, and he can see and hear, and, and I think of this king looking at his daughter who's blind. You know, and I think about, this should be called King Guy, you know? And, which is one viable way to stage this show. So there are a lot of very important stories about love and how people deal with love in this opera. And I think that it showed that, that, that Tchaikovsky himself was really coming to terms with his belief that love was enough in writing this particular opera. So thanks for listening to my, my, uh, my Jeremiad about love. Thank you.